Hi, this is Rainer Meyer. And Sydney Claire Meyer from Emil Berliner Studios. We are going to talk about recordings, background information and the new original Source series releases. I joined DG in the 80s as a recording engineer and apart from doing new classical recordings, I spent a lot of time doing digital remasterings from the older analog recordings. In 2017, I joined Emil Berliner Studios as a vinyl cutting engineer and I immediately got into the analog workflows. I even damaged an original master tape during my very first week at EBS, but don't tell anyone. When we first started to develop the project idea, it quickly became clear that we would be focusing on the 70s quadraphonic tapes. I knew that this part of the catalog would actually have a great potential for vinyl reissues in terms of quality. Let's jump in by looking at the different steps in the workflow of the 70s. In this picture, we can see a recording technician and he is in the process of assembling the recording tapes to create a original master tape. On the left machine, you see the original recording takes. The beginning of each take can be identified by the white stickers. You can see the score and the recording producer has marked the edits in there. According to the edit list, the technician is splicing the recording tapes and reassembling them on the right machine. This is an editing tape. And since it is a little bit translucent, you can see that there is a really nifty dovetail connection underneath. So we know that the technician cut it with scissors manually. And he also marked the tape number on the tape. By producing everything in an immersive format, DG was quite ahead of their time. They did not only record, they edited, mastered and archived in the quadraphonic four-track format. G wanted to release these outstanding recordings on regular vinyl LP in stereo, of course. For this purpose, the recording team mixed the four-track tape down to the stereo version. On the original quadraphonic tape, the signal was separated into direct sound coming from the orchestra in the front and the response of sound of the hall coming from the rear. For the stereo version they needed a mix of both, but now with the huge advantage of being able to change this balance later in the post-production, under better listening conditions. The next production step is called Freigabe, which means tape approval, and this person was in charge of listening to the recording with a score in order to check the program musically and technically. He also gave a recommendation for the disc level. When the tape was sent to the cutting room, you can see the engineer during the process of lace cutting. The turnaround time for the test pressings was only about two weeks because Deutsche Grammophon did their own plating. Here again you see the quality check where the test pressing is compared with the stereo down mix. After approval the product was released for manufacturing. Back in the day, Deutsche Grammophon was a part of the parent company called Polygram, which owned pressing plants all over the world. So the stereo mix had to be duplicated and these tape copies were sent to pressing plants around the world for local manufacturing. If you find the number 320 in the lead out, you will have a German pressing from Hannover. You always hear about how the German Deutsche Grammophon releases sound better than the international ones. One of the reasons might be that there is one less step involved in the post-production, namely a tape generation. For our new original source series, we skip most of the post-production steps to the absolutely minimum. We do the mixing from the four-track tape in real time while we are cutting. This means that we don't need to use a tape copy. Since multiple post-production steps are condensed into one simultaneous process, there is only one team involved to make sonic decisions. To achieve the absolute highest audiophile quality, we must go to the limits of what is mechanically possible on the disc. It is not our concern that this can be reproduced at any other place in the world. Coming back to the tapes we are using nowadays. As the name of this series suggests, we go back to the original sources. This means we are using the four-track originals assembled together of the tapes which has been recorded on the recording sessions. Before we talk about how we used these quadraphonic masters for cutting today, let's quickly look back at the workflow of the 70s again. On the quadro master we can find a hint which reads Achtung, attention, four-track original, and below that 
to track down Max under 2530268A. It refers to the quarter inch two track down mix tape with the same number. An interesting detail is a stamp on the bottom left corner. On the 16th of August 72, Mr. Wollert approved this tape. He also recommended a disc level of minus 6 dB. On the 17th of August, Mr. Schulze made the first cut at cutting room 1. And he followed the recommendation and cut with a disc level of minus 6 dB. On the back of the box, we can see some more details. There's a note from Mr. Schulze that refers to disk parameters. About two weeks later, after the test pressing had been approved, they started making tape copies for the international distribution. These quarter-inch tape copies or downmix tapes are not being used for the original source series. Let us show you how we mixed, mastered and cut directly from the four-track master tapes. Here you see our cutting and mixing room at Emi Berliner Studios. We need a machine with two four-track heads. Between the preview and program tape heads, the tape path is extended to create an analog delay. It is needed for the Groove computer to be able to calculate the most efficient way to use the disk space. This is our own developed passive mixing desk. It has only one knob to set the ratio between the front and the rear channels mixed down to the stereo version. From the passive mixer, we run the signal through our mastering unit, SP79, and it came with our VMS80 cutting lathe from Neumann. It's very rare. If needed, we could also add some analog signal processing to the chain. Thanks to the amazing quality of the tapes and the recordings, we were able to keep it very pure and not a lot of processing was needed. From the mastering units, the signal goes to the Autophone custom-made cutting amplifiers. This is the Rolls-Royce of cutting amplifiers. Most of the cutting equipment we are using today was taken over from DG. After the studio had moved from Hanover to Berlin, we found boxes with thousands of documents about DG research and developments in the field of disc cutting and pressing. We came across documents describing the advantages of using diamond styli instead of sapphire and found some old specimens as well. So we got in touch with a manufacturer who custom made a diamond stylus for us. We tested it and discovered real advantages in sound because the facets of the stone can be polished in a more precise way. The self-erasure that happens in the moment of cutting is reduced because the burnishing facets are smaller. The result is a better high-frequency response. This is by far not the only aspect of improved high-frequency response. The former workflow involved a lot more devices that all increase the danger of losses. Even small misalignments of, for example, the tape heads of different tape machines can add up to an audible loss of quality. We can actually demonstrate these losses and thereby the improvements of the new series, so bear with us. This is a picture of the recording setup of Smetana's Mavlast. The recording took place in Boston in February 1971. They removed all chairs to get a nicer and longer reverb and they placed the orchestra in the middle of the hall. They used four Shep's M221B tube microphones as a quadraphonic microphone setup. You can see the red light to show the orchestra when the recording team is ready for recording. And you can see a speaker where the recording producer could communicate with the orchestra and the conductor. On the very left you can also see a television camera and it was used for visual contact between the concert hall and the control room where the recording team was sitting. As the TV camera was an analog device at this time, running with 25 pictures and 625 lines per second, it made a tiny noise, almost inaudible for our ears. When playing a very quiet passage where there's no music, we can still see the television line frequency in the spectrum, in the old version as well as the new one. The interesting thing is that the ratio of this noise to the noise floor is different. 
This means that we have much more high frequency information on the new version. At the same time, we have much less background noise. Pointing out this television line frequency helps to understand how much better the high frequency response is nowadays. The overtones of the instruments benefit from the better transmission just as much as the unwanted line frequency. Let's check out the differences in sound. We are comparing the new original source series test pressings to the old releases from the 70s. We could analyze the audio using analyzing tools. You may have noticed that the new original source series sounds much wider and fuller. When comparing the disc surfaces of Verdi Requiem, we used slightly more space than the old release. Additionally, we have microscopic pictures of these passages. Check out the significant visual differences of the same forceful orchestral passage. Let's listen to the new original source series. And listen to the old version. All new cuts are higher in loudness and sound wider without any compromise in low frequency response. As all of these features need more physical space on the disk surface, the question is how we manage to achieve such huge differences. The engineers at that time were absolute experts after all. Yes, but they followed a slightly different task. There the focus was set to achieve a constant quality created by different people with different equipment in different cutting studios all over the world. Our intention is to avoid any restrictions in sound while mixing, mastering and cutting, leaving no safety margin. Not to forget, there have been developments in analog equipment over the last 50 years. The cutting lathe's pitch computer, for example, is much more efficient than in the 70s. Using the original sources instead of using tape copies avoids any loss of sound quality that might stem from the longer workflow in the old days. The final quality of the product does not only depend on us. We need a partner with the same drive. We are in very close contact with the people at Optimal Media. Shout out to Thorsten. He can look at the grooves through his really awesome microscope. This is a microscopic picture of the grooves of Mahler Symphony No. 5. And as you can see, the rightmost arrow points to a passage in which the groove is very narrow. This could potentially be an issue for tracking. Errors can happen. So Optimal Media asked us to do a revision. This doesn't mean that we are lowering the bar in general. We just have to do better for this specific passage. Coming to the end. With the original source series, we now have the chance to push the limits for a pure analog and highly audiophile release on LP as far as possible. We want to show that the sound of this legendary analog recording stands up to any comparison even to the most modern recordings. And there was no need to use any digital processing. The quality is outstanding. Closing your eyes, you will not believe that these recordings are 50 years old. We hope you enjoy these new releases and we would love to hear from you about your listening experience.